We are in lesson uh, 22, I mean lesson 13, chapter 22 in the book of Exodus. Now what, let me just catch up where we've been. Chapter 20, the Lord spoke out of the cloud, and all the children of Israel had gathered there at the valley of the, uh, around the Mount of Mount Sinai. And they were up on a boundary line in the, out of the cloud where they could see Moses, they could see Joshua, they could see Aaron, but Joshua's name has not come up yet, but he's there. They hear the voice of the Lord give the Ten Commandments in chapter 20. If you remember at the end of chapter 20, the people cry out, the elders cry out to Moses and says, Don't let God speak to us anymore. You tell him to tell you and you tell us because it is too fearsome for us. We are so afraid whenever he speaks to us. And so Moses climbs up through the cloud and there the Lord gives an ordinance for the people. It is one ordinance that has many parts to it. Uh, well, you might call it a judgment. It is the judgment of God on certain topics of how, adding to the Ten Commandments, the Lord expects the Israelites to live their life with one another. All of these parts of this one ordinance are extremely important to God and as the Lord speaks to them in successive revelations until they have been in the wilderness for two years, until the Ark of the Covenant is built and the tabernacle is built and everything is completed and ready for them to go into the promised land, the Lord continues to add to each of his ordinances or parts of his ordinance. Uh, we might call it some policy or some rule, or some fact that needs to be added to so the people understand without any confusion the meanings of what the Lord's rules are, the Lord's judgment is on different items. Now, we've already been through a third of these um, parts of this judgment or this ordinance that is coming down from the Lord. So we're in the second part of the third and next week we'll do the last part of the third it's chapter 21 22 and 23 are all parts of this one ordinance that's being dropped down but it has all these parts and so we pick up with part nine part nine is about theft it says here it says if a man steals an ox or sheep and slaughters it and sells it or sells it now picture this in your mind. Let's slow down. I probably should have broken this one up a little bit more so we can look at, look at it a little piece by piece. So we'll just do it naturally here in our lesson. Someone steals an ox or a sheep. Now let me tell you something. An ox is very important. An ox is important to the livelihood of the Israelites. Maybe not so much while they're in this first two years, while they're in the wilderness. And before I go on, remember this. The plan for for Israel, the plan for Moses and the people, as far as they know, they are there to hear the judgments and the, the laws of the Lord, to build a tabernacle, a Ark of the Covenant, a table of showbread, all the things they need for their worship. And then at the end of two years, they are going to go into the promised land and they're going to start taking the promised land. Now, speeding ahead of what is not in the scripture yet, we know what happened. At the end of the two years, they're in Kadesh Barnea. It will take them 11 days to pack up their gear and go meet their first foe in the land of, the, of Canaan to take and to capture that land to make it theirs. What happens is they send 12 spies in. You remember that? Joshua and Caleb come back, and they do not give the same report. They come back, and they, everybody says, Oh, the land is fill, filled with milk and honey. We can't go because the people are so numerous that they're like giants, and we can't defeat them with the soldiers that we have. Caleb and, and Joshua said, No, the Lord is fighting for us. We can go on in. So they took a vote. They took a vote. And the unanimous vote was of the people, we shall not go. Well, Moses says, well, y'all messed up. 
Now, that's my what I'm saying. I'm, I'm giving my interpretation that y'all messed up. By the next morning, uh, after Moses explained to them how they've messed up, they come back the next morning and say, no, 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 no. We changed our mind. That was just a little mediation going on between us and God. No, no, and Moses says, no, it wasn't. It, you made your decision and your vote last night, and your net, unanimous vote was wrong. Therefore, the Lord has said to you, you're going to go back to Mount Sinai, and you're going to camp at Mount Sinai for 38 years until every one of you who is over 20 years of age will die and be buried in the sand. And that's what happened. So during the time that they're in the wilderness, this is, this, these laws and everything are not as important because the Lord's providing every meal for them, providing the water for them, providing everything they need. The manna will not stop until they are ready to go into the promised land 40 years later. An ox is going to be vitally important to landowners. Now let's talk about that just a second. I didn't put it here, but it will come up and we'll get it as we get there. But I'm going to go ahead and give you a teaser on it. Whenever they go into the promised land, the land as they capture it is divided amongst the 12 tri tribes. So you have tribal areas. Judah, Benjamin, and Ephraim, Nasa, Gad on the other side, half of Gad on the other side. It goes on up to Dan. These tribal areas are then broken down to family plots. Each family unit that is alive when they take the promised land is granted a deed and title to that land. So the land belongs to that family unit. Now we're not there yet, but we're going to get there. That land cannot be sold, I mean cannot be used as collateral against a loan. It's not ever supposed to be used. And they could use everything else in creation as collateral against a loan, but not the land because the land belonged to the family. However, the law did provide for the land to be sold. So the land could be sold, or a part and parcel of the land could be sold. But there's a hiccup the Lord throws in on that, in that every 50th year, after 49 years, the land was required to be returned to the original family heirs that got it whenever they went into the promised land. So let's say in year 45, the family decides to sell the land to someone. The new owner looks at the land and says, okay, I have five years to purchase this land and to own it and to gather a gain from it, but five years from now, I have to return it back to them without cost. They don't sell it back to them. It has to be given back to them to the original deed owners called the year of Jubilee. By the time of Solomon's day, he had seen this happen 10 times because we're talking about every 50th year that 500 years had passed by the time Solomon was 80 years old. It had happened 10 times where the land was given back to the original landowners. And if land money was borrowed, it could only be borrowed for six years. At the end of six years, every debt was freed and done away with, whether it was full, fully paid off or not, at the end of six years. Now, that was in that first section of the laws we looked at in chapter 21. So now we're down to the land, and, and this land is important to people because land is where they gain their crops. Land is where they have their feed. Land is where they, they feed their animals. Land is where they uh, herd their animals. Land is where they water their animals. Land is where they put up their houses. This land is important. And one, the major beast of burden for the Israelites will be the ox. It's the major beast of burden. It will, it will help plow the field. It will be used to haul the grain in the cart off to be, uh, to be uh, uh, separated from the husk and down to the seed. It will be the, the animal that will haul the grain down to be sold at the marketplace. The ox is very important. So what happens is, is a person comes in, and by the way, in the nation of Israel, as we will see as the law of the Lord is spun out, there is absolutely no reason in the nation of Israel that anyone should steal anything from anybody because all they have to do is ask. And the people that they're asking it from are pretty much obliged to give it to them to help them in some way, form, or fashion. Israel was 
was to be a nation where they were helping each other no matter what. If you needed something, it was there for you. So for you to be a thief in the nation of Israel was really just going against all the laws of God that he's going to lay out. And plenty of that happened, by the way. So if a man steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it, or he sells it, that means he's stolen that sheep or whatever, or that oxen, he kills it, does away with it, packs it around, gives it whatever he does with it, and he is caught. He shall pay five oxen for that ox or four sheep for a sheep. The ox was worth more than a sheep was. So he gets caught. He has to pay back five oxen for the one ox that he stole. If he stole five, he has to pay back 25 oxen. Now, most families only had one, by the, two, by the way, maybe two at the most. Verse 2 says this, If the thief is caught while breaking in and is struck so that he dies, there will be no blood guiltiness on his account. Oh, so that means that the owner catches him trying to steal it and he kills him. The owner is free and clear. In other words, he is not considered that he has murdered anyone or murdered that thief. That thief came in, came into his land, was trying to steal it. Owner finds it, shoots him dead with an arrow. Lo and behold, the, the owner has every right to do that. Now the Lord's fixing to put a little twist on that. Let's catch the twist. Which tells us when this first part could happen legally. Verse 3. But if the sun has risen on him. Okay, what does that mean? He was talking about if the thief came in to steal the ox, the sheep, the first time. He's talking about that happens at night. If the thief comes in at night to try to steal, the owner has the right to shoot. Now listen, folks, this is Israeli law, not American law, okay? <laughs> this is for the Israelites. I forgot to give the the warning here okay this is how what the Israelites are to live by so if it happens not but if the sun is risen on him there will be blood guiltiness on his account in other words if the sun is risen and you see who that person is that's stealing that ox right in front of you and you know who he is you can't kill him you can't kill him why because you know who he is why he's an Israelite why? Because his last name's going to be the town or the village from where he is. He comes from. You're going to be able to find him. You're going to be able to hunt him down. You're going to be able to search for him. It's one of the reasons why these cities of refuge, these sanctuary cities are, the Lord's going to set up so that families cannot come and take vengeance and take the law into their own hands. By the way, sanctuary cities in the Bible, in this part of the Bible where we're going to be, do not look anything like what America is trying to do, sanctuary cities. Sanctuary cities in the Bible, which we did in last week's lesson, chapter 21. Sanctuary cities were for the purpose of making sure someone got a fair trial. It wasn't a place where they could go and live forever and continue doing evil deeds. They could go there if someone had, if they had actually committed manslaughter, if they had killed someone accidentally. Let's, let's put it that way, accidentally and they needed to stand before the judge, they could flee to a sanctuary city or, as we saw last week also, to an altar. And the altar was sacred. And no one would take anyone from the altar to hurt them. No family member would dare do that because that's against God's law to take someone from the altar when they're worshiping to kill them to get revenge. But they would go before a sanctuary city, they'd wait, they'd spend their time before the judge, and if the judge said they were guilty and death was the penalty, they could run to every altar they wanted to in every sanctuary city in the world, and now, because the judge has said they are guilty and the death penalty should be upon them, they can e people can even take them from the altar of the Lord, according to chapter 21, and put them to death. Because they've stood before the magistrates. They've stood before the judges. And we're going to see that as we go through this lesson too. That the judges are very important in God's law. No one is to take the law into their own hands under God's uh, instruction here. So, if the sun is risen, there will be, you will be guilty of murder if you kill someone that you can recognize even though he is a thief. 
He shall surely, because you're going to recognize him, you're going to be able to capture him. He shall surely make restitution if he owns nothing. That means he's a poor man. He has nothing. Guess what? Then he shall be sold for his theft. In other words, he will be captured, but he has nothing because he's a poor man. He's a renegade. He's a runaway from his family or whatever. So he's a thief also. So they take him. They're going to sell him to be a slave. At the first part of the, this ordinance, the Lord handled this first. If anyone is sold to be a slave, they can only serve for how long? Six years. That's right. At the end of the six years, the debt is paid on everything. That doesn't mean he can't go out and go steal something again, go right back into being a slave. The problem with that is, is being a slave is often better than not being a slave. Because when you're a slave, you're getting fed. When you're a slave, you got a place to sleep. And so it is with some of our guys who have spent 35 years uh, up in Huntsville. And when they get out, they go, things are so hard out here. What can I do to go back? And they do something to go back. Because they have no skills, they have no livelihood, they have anything. And they also have a prison sentence on their life. And for them, it's better to be there to where they've learned, like animals, to be told where to go, when to go, how to shower, when not to shower, what to eat, what not to eat, what to do, and what not to do. It's just the way they get to after 35 years of being in prison. We would wish that that wouldn't happen, but it does. That's how some people think. Well, so, let's say that he is the thief is found, verse, five, verse 4. Uh, if he stole, uh, uh, if what he stole is actually found alive and in his possession... Whether an ox or a donkey or a sheep or whatever it is, he shall pay double. In other words, he has to return the donkey that he has and he has to go pay or return the value of a donkey again. Now, I will not, never will forget about two years ago, I was down in our Justice of the Peace Court down in uh, Clear Lake and I thought it was interesting because <clears throat> the judge down there spent an hour and a half with two teenagers and their parents trying to decide who actually owned an iPad. You got it? What's interesting about this is the conclusion of what actually happened in that court, that court under that judge matches this exactly, this last... He had the iPad, boyfriend had the iPad, girlfriend says it's hers. Ex-girlfriend, of course, as you understand. The parents are there, they're arguing back and forth, and it goes on for an hour and a half, and I'm sitting there going, man, I didn't think this little session was going to take this long. And I've got appointments, I need to get back to the office, but I'm waiting it out because I've got a person there that I'm sitting there to be a, to be a, 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 a a cheerleader in the audience for. I'm not going to witness or anything. And lo and behold, when it was all said and done, what, the way it ended up was, the little girl finally said, well, judge, after an hour and a half, I can prove that's my iPad because there's a marking on the back of the iPad underneath the case that I put on it. To which the judge looks and says, son, do you know what that marking is? Well, he made something up, but it wasn't correct. She had taken a big old Sharpie and wrote her name in huge letters across the back of that iPad and then put the case on it. Well, of course, we opened it up. And guess what was there? Her name. So the judge says, I believe that that is her iPad. And I find judgment for her in the amount of $500. She will have her iPad returned to her, and you will also pay her $500. What did the judge just do? Just returned. I'm not saying it's always going to be that way in America, okay? But that judge did the same thing. The donkey was found. The donkey was alive. You're the thief. You pay back the donkey and you pay back another donkey's worth, whatever it's worth. Now, by the way, there's going to be amount of money that every donkey is worth. There's going to be amount that every sheep is worth. So if you don't have sheep, you may have to pay in silver or gold. For that, for that animal that you stole. But there's no reason for a thief to be a thief in Israel. The vineyard in the field. Verse 5. If a man lets a field or a vineyard be grazed bare and lets his animals loose so that it grazes in another man's field, he shall make restitution for the best of his own field and the best of his own vineyard. Okay, just understand this. Nice and quick. 
a man has allowed his field to be totally grazed bare and there's nothing and there's, he's still got to feed this animal. So he lets his animal go into somebody else's field, okay, and eats it. Eats from the field or from the vineyard. The animals eat. He's caught and the owner of the other fields take him before the magistrates. That's not here, but it will basically come up in a little bit later on uh, as, we, as we go through this. Uh, the judgment is, is when that man in the next year has his field raised, it's the new year, he must allow the other owner who he grazed on his land without permission to bring his cattle over to your best of the land. You see it says the word best? The best, not the poorest, not the worst, not the scraggly, but the best that he has to grace. That best is going to come out even more as the Lord is going to give more instructions. The best is to be the best lamb, not to be spotted, not to be scarred, not to be lame, not to be in any way hurt at all. That best offering you give to the Lord is to be the best that you have. The people were to put on the best clothing that they had to come to the foot of, the, of Mount Sinai to hear the Lord tell them the Ten Commandments. It was to be their best. It was to be clean. It was to be ready for the Lord. It was to be the best. And for us, when we are here, we are to come with our best before the Lord when we come to study His Word and we come to worship. It's amazing to me, as I've already said, that we all seem to know how to dress for weddings and funerals, but we do not dress the same way to come worship the Lord. How disappointing and disappointed the Lord must be. So, if you allow your animals to graze on somebody else's field next year you got it's field for field vineyard for vineyard you're going to have to allow them to come and graze on yours to pay back if a fire breaks out and spreads to thorn bushes so that stacked grain or the standing grain or the field itself is consumed he who started the fire shall surely make restitution you start the fire it gets loose it burns somebody else's stuff up you are responsible for that fire. You must pay for the damage. Let me tell you something. I remember the day when you could buy a bale of hay for $12. I think that bale is about $42 right now. Well, listen, you don't, you don't understand... If you've got some alfalfa hay out there, okay, good stuff, really good stuff. And there's a thousand bales of hay sitting there and you throw a cigarette out that starts that fire. That is not a cheap fire to make restitution. Not cheap. Just get your cell phones out and add up 1,000 times $42. It's not cheap. It's a lot of money. Was it worth it? I have to ask. Verse 7. If a man gives his neighbor... We're talking about goods and trusts now. If a man gives his neighbor money or goods to keep for him, and it is stolen from the man's house, if the thief is caught, he shall pay double. In other words, the thief pays double. In other words, he gets it, he gets the stuff back, pays double. Just like with the ox and all of that. Uh-oh, let's see something else. Verse 8. If the thief is not caught, then the owner of the house shall appear before the judges... There's the judges coming in to determine whether he laid his hands on his neighbor's property. Let's say, let's say you gave your girlfriend and you gave your boyfriend an iPad to keep for you or to use. And then y'all broke up. And then lo and behold, the iPad goes missing. Okay. The thing that needs to happen is you go before the judge to find out and determine whether you were responsible. Was this something that you did purposefully? Did he destroy the iPad? Did he sell the iPad? Did he do something with it that required uh, him to uh, be responsible more than just slight care for that iPad? Okay, here we go. So, you go before the judge. Whatever the judge says is what's to happen. Let me tell you something if you haven't ever noticed. I don't know how many of y'all have been in court before, but I am 
awfully fearful when I go into a courtroom just to sit. Because that judge has so much power that whether what he determines is right or wrong makes no difference. If you're involved in something that he says you're in contempt of court and you shall go to jail, whether you're in the right or the wrong, and you may prove yourself to be in the wrong later on by the judge, it doesn't matter. You're going to spend time. It doesn't matter. And that judge may or may not give you a true and accurate verdict according to the law. That is for the appeals court to decide. It's an awesome and fearful thing to go before a judge. I was in another one of our JP courts where a woman owed $500 on her rent. She was being evicted. And by the time that uh, it got to the judge's desk, they had ramped up the fees for this and the fee for that and according to this and according to that. They had ramped up $2,800 and something dollars of what she owed to be able to stay in that apartment and not be evicted if she could pay it. Or even if she was evicted, she'd still owe that amount of money. To which the judge looked to the lady who most of the time people are being evicted don't show up. So the judge is shocked when there's someone there. So she looks to the lady and she says, ma'am, what can you pay? She says, I only have $451. I don't have enough money. And I remember very well the judge saying, $451 will be enough. And she wiped out all the fees and everything. Hey, when you go before the judge, no matter which side you're on, you don't know what the judge is going to say. And when they sign that order, it's done. It's done. So that lady went back. She paid the $451 that day before she left to the ladies. And lo and behold, she's still in that apartment. They don't dare take her to court to evict her but she hadn't been late one time either, okay? But the management have said, we don't dare take her. We don't dare take her because that judge is favorable to her. Whether right or wrong, I don't know, but all I know is it's a fearful thing to be before a judge, and even in this day, when the Lord is investing in the judges of, of Moses' day, he is investing in those judges the power to determine who owes what, and it's the way it's going to be when they make that decision. Look at here, verse 29, verse 9 says, we're talking about breach of trust. For every breach of trust in Israel, whether it is for an ox, whether it's for a donkey, whether it's for sheep, whether it's for clothing, or for any lost thing about which one says, this is it, this is mine, okay? The case of both parties shall come before the judges. He whom the judges condemns must pay double to his neighbor. In other words, you go before the judge, guess what? It can go either way, and whichever way it goes, the person who loses is going to pay double back to the other person. In Israel, thank goodness, that's the way it is in Israel. That's the laws we're talking about here, not specifically ours. Verse 10, if a man gives his neighbor a donkey or an ox or a sheep, or any animal to keep for him, and it dies, or is hurt, or is driven away, while no one is looking. Did you catch that? Animals are animals are animals are animals are animals. They didn't have barbed wire fences. They didn't have cages. They didn't have gates. They, if they wanted to keep something, they had to tie it up. Knots come undone. The longer an ox pulls on a, on a rope that's been tied up, that knot either tightens up or loosens up. We all know that. We've all, well, most of us boys in here, maybe not the girls, but we've tied our shoes before so tight that we thought that would last forever. Next thing you know, we got an untied shoe. The same thing happens with ropes and all that type of stuff. We keep going down and tightening the lines and tying the lines on our boats. We have to check them, check them, check them. Because certainly at some point in time, they're going to pull themselves to where they've worked the knot to other stuff. They work loose and they're gone. Animals are the same way. An animal gets loose and lo and behold, the ox falls in a ditch. Have you ever had an ox in your ditch? Have you ever had your ox in a ditch? Ox falls in the ditch, ox dies, breaks his neck and dies. The ox is purely there. We see the ox. The ox has gotten out, the ox has died. In that case, whenever the animal has gotten loose on its own and it's gotten hurt or it's died, what's the penalty? Here's the penalty. An oath before the Lord shall be made by the two of them that he has not laid hands on his neighbor's property. In other words... 
the animal just died. I never will forget, we had two parents. We were going out of town for three weeks, and we needed somebody to take care of our two parents. These were the loudest parrots you ever heard because they were those type of parrots, those, um, mm, mm, um, those red-headed birds that, no, no, the little bitty ones, the red-headed that are in, always in pairs. Love birds. Love birds, okay? And, and, and Kay loved the love birds, and I'm not going to say I had much love for the love birds, okay? But they were a pain and messy. And so we left them with a friend. And when we came back, we got our lovebirds and went home, and we kept re realizing those lovebirds were not acting like they knew us any longer. <laughs> well, I come to find out the lovebirds had gotten out, and the family felt so bad about it, they went and bought two no new lovebirds for us. <laughs> then I found out Kay wished that I'd killed them already. The old ones, not the new ones, because she didn't like them either. Well, they got younger lovebirds than we had because we'd had hires for a long time. We had lovebirds for a long time. If you've taken care of something for somebody and it dies, just tell them it died. Yes, sir. That's what's just covering right there. If it dies, let's say that ox is standing there tied up and you've got it tied up for the night and you come out the next morning and the ox is laying on the ground and it's just died of a heart attack. It's just died. There's no penalty for that. No, because animals are going to die. There's no penalty for that. That's what the Lord says. The two of them to make an oath. The neighbor did not lay his hand on him. He was taking care of him. The ox just died. It just died. Okay? And its owner shall accept it. And he shall not make restitution. Verse 12. But if it is actually stolen from him, he shall make restitution to its owner. So in other words, the only way, uh, if that ox is just stolen, goes back to the other law, the other little judgment's been up here. It, it's, he's going to have to go before the judge and he owes it. He's gonna, however, there is one way to get around that. that the Lord provides. Verse 13. If it is all torn to pieces, let him bring it as evidence. He shall not make restitution for what has been torn to pieces. Ah, what well, has got an ox? It's torn. What part are you going to bring back to show somebody that that was your animal? Well, in this day and well up into the time throughout the rest of the Bible, they never took a hot iron and scorched a name on an animal that had horns and hoofs. On those animals, they carved their symbol on every hoof and on each horn that they had. Therefore, when you found an animal been torn apart by maybe a lion or a tiger or a bear, oh my, you grabbed the horn, you grabbed the hoof, and you brought it in, and it was proof that the animal had been torn to pieces. It may not have been proof that you're the one that tore it to pieces, but it at least got you off the hook at that point in time. Looking on. Now, let's get away from animals and let's get down to virgins. So the Lord applies a part of this judgment to virgins. If a man seduces a virgin, that means he has sex with her, okay? Who is not engaged. In other words, some whether he's having sex with her and they are not engaged. And lies with her, in other words. He must pay a dowry to her, to her to be his wife. Now, remember this because it is already established in what God has laid out in the book of Genesis and Exodus. Anyone who has a sexual relationship with a person of the opposite sex is now married. It is not something where you have to have a special ceremony, a preacher, a judge, or anything. The act of sex between a man and a woman, married or not married or whatever, okay, marries them because it marries the two parts together. They're considered married. So when a man comes, as was the case with Shechem and Dinah, Dinah is the daughter of the 12 brothers of Jacob, uh, brothers, sons of Jacob. Shechem came and had a relationship with Dinah, and then he came to pay the dowry, to make the arrangement and everything with Jacob. 
and with the brothers, Shechem was following this same law. The dowry that you need to understand was for the purpose of laying aside money for the care of the bride in case the husband was a scoundrel, the husband could not provide, the husband was killed, the husband left home, the husband divorced her. It was a fund that was put in the trust of the father's hands or the brother's hands brother's hands, to keep for her in case she was abandoned some way, form or fashion, and, and the supplies that she needed to live were not available. That's what the dowry was for. It wasn't just a payment for the daughter to the dad. It was a savings account for the good of the bride. All right? Well, let's say this sexual relationship has happened But the dad has determined in his heart that he is not going to allow his daughter to be married to that man. As if he can do anything about the marrying part. Because they're already married. Here's the instruction. If her father absolutely refuses to give her to him, he shall pay money equal to the dowry of virgins. Dad, they're already married. If you do not want her to be with him, then you must pay him the dowry amount. By Deuteronomy chapter 22, we're going to find out the dowry for a, vir- for a person to become the wife of another man was 50 shekels. So dad, if you don't want her to be with that man, you've got to pay that man 50 shekels. Then you can have your daughter back. You can redeem her back. That's an easy way to do a divorce, I guess, or something like that. Just have a set price out there for women. Now, some of you women would like to be worth a little more than the rest of the women, but it didn't matter to the Bible. You were worth 50 shekels. So now, some of y'all won't ever come back to this class because you've been offended, hadn't you? All right. Well, you're worth a whole lot more than 50 shekels to me. I promise that. You shall not allow a sorceress to live. Time out. I did not do a good job on this commentary, so I need to bring you up a little bit to speed. What is sorcery? I should have put this in. I may add a paragraph to the notes. Sorcery is when you use what we would call her herbs or um, extracts of plants, uh, uh, body parts, and boiling this and boiling that to make some sort of concoction that a person would drink that would cause them to uh, cause their mind to hallucinate in some form or fashion. Sorcery, both the Hebrew word and the Greek word that is translated sorcery in our Bible, is the root word for pharmacology. It means to ingest drugs or ingest Uh, mixtures of potions and spells. A spell, by the way, was not a spell like we think of the spells today. A spell is taking something that causes you to go crazy in your head. Instructions concerning human and animal relations. This is terrible. I hate this. Verse 19, whoever lies with an animal shall surely be put to death. That means a sexual relationship with an animal. Why is the Lord sticking that in there? Are there Israelites doing this? Absolutely, there had to be. You know why? He put it in here. Number one. Number two is, we know that in Egyptian heritage, they did as part of their worships. We know that in Canaanite heritage, they did. They're coming out of a land where they've been in bondage for 430 years, and they did this. And they're going to go into a land where the people do this. So surely the Lord is saying, I want you to be different than the people you came, just came from and the people where you're going. This is, an, and we're going to find out as we go through this, the Lord's going to call this an abomination. It's abomination. Now, abomination has a whole nother uh, definition that makes this even worse. Sacrifice to other gods. He who sacrifices to any god other than the Lord alone shall be utterly destroyed. Well, that's not just the death penalty, is it? Do you see it? He shall be utterly destroyed in other words we're not talking just about temporal life here on earth we're talking about eternal life utterly destroyed 
utterly until the ends of the world, destroyed, away from the presence of the Lord, out of the possibility of the grace of the Lord. If you worship any God besides the one true Lord God, you are setting for yourself a destiny without God. Now listen, Israel's going to do okay with this for several hundred years. Then, lo and behold, uh, the northern kingdom, after Solomon dies, the kingdom is going to be split into two kingdoms. And the northern kingdom is not going to do very well at all because every king that it has is an abomination to the Lord and worships other gods. And so the Assyrians are going to be sent by the Lord to destroy the northern kingdom and pull out of the northern kingdom a remnant of, according to Amos, 10%, according to Micah, 10%, according to Jeremiah, 10%, and take them over into exile in Assyria. The Lord only pulls out the best of the best. And those who worship other gods are destroyed on the land in the northern kingdom. That best of the best ends up over to Syria, and lo and behold, within just a few years, the Assyrian government is going to ask the uh, council of the Israelites who are there in exile. And it comes to the fact where the Assyrians don't make any move without the approval of the Israelites who are in exile in Assyria. 150 years after that, down in the southern kingdom, after Manasseh has been there and all of that, lo and behold, the Lord comes and he removes all of the cream of the crop. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, the royal, all these great, wonderful, godly people. Takes them over to Babylon as Nebuchadnezzar comes in and destroys all the southern kingdom. All those who worshipped of the gods were put to the side. And all those who worshipped the true God were saved and taken to Bab in, into exile. Two of which... Seventy years later, the conglomeration of all the godly of the northern kingdom and all the godly of the southern kingdom are allowed because they've been, they're all part of the same kingdom over there under uh, the Persian Cyrus the Great are allowed now to return back, if they wish, to return back to uh, Jerusalem and to Judea and to that southern area to build, to rebuild their kingdom and live on their land. But it's not their land, it belongs to the Persians. And then it's not going to belong to, not going to go back to them. The Persians are going to lose it to the Greeks. And the Greeks are going to lose it on down to the Romans. And then finally, by the time of Jesus, the Romans are in charge of the land. It will not become their land again until 1948 when Britain defeated that land and the enemies of the war, the war uh, First World War, and took that under their control in 1948. They gave that land back to Israel. Lo and behold, fulfilling the prophecy in Hosea that they would be without that land for 2,500 years. It was not 2,500 years. It was 2,553 years to be exact. And they got their land back after they were exiled off of it. I think the extra 53 years is close enough to call the Bible accurate on that. All right? All right. So here we go. Because it actually says it's going to happen in the middle of that third century. Well, it did in the middle. Well, let's look on. You shall not wrong a stranger or oppress him. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Every stranger who comes in your midst, they needed to look at them as, this is a possible friend. This is a possible believer in the Lord. They are there also to make disciples of the one true Yahweh God. Do not treat the stranger that comes into your midst the way you were treated in Egypt, in other words. Oh yeah, you were invited to go over there by Joseph at the invitation of Pharaoh, and Pharaoh treated you as guest and gave you the best of the best. But guess what? When a Pharaoh came along, a Pharaoh of the Hissocks, who did not know Joseph or remember or know any of that history, then they were put under bondage as strangers and as slaves for 400 years. So lo and behold, as we can see, the Lord says, don't treat people the way you were treated, Israel. You shall not afflict any willow or orphan. If you afflict him at all, and if he does cry out to me, I will surely hear his cry. And my anger will be kindled, 
He says, my anger will be kindled and I will kill you with the sword and your wives shall become widows and your children fatherless. He's saying to Israel, to leadership, don't you dare oppress the widows and the orphans. If you do, I will have you killed by the sword. And I want to remind you, killing by the sword was done by enemy nations that the Lord would send against Israel, not by the penalty of the Israelites and the judges, because the penalty of the Israelites and the judges to impose the death penalty was one of two ways, by stoning or by burning, but not by the sword. The sword was saved for the Lord to use against Israel by sending evil nations in to, to punish them for what they have done. So what he's saying is, is you, you Israelite leaders, if you oppress the, the widows and the orphans, I am going to send people who will kill you by the sword. I believe I'd do right on that case. You too. If you lend money to people, to the poor among you, you are not to act as a creditor to him. You shall not charge him interest. I love this. This word interest. Y'all think you know what interest means? Here's what interest means. You have to look these words up. Interest means the bite of a serpent. The venom of the bite of a serpent. A little obedio snake, a rattlesnake about that long comes along. Hits you, bites you, oh, that's just, the amount of venom that that little old snake put in me compared to the rest of the fluids of my body, well, the fluids of my body can surely overpower the venom of that snake. And then you wait an hour, and it swells. And you wait another hour or so, and you're in trouble. Because that little venom has grown and grown and taken over and taken over, and taken over until it's taken over all the fluids in your body. And you're sick. What started out as looking like, that's oh, that's just a little bit of interest. That won't make any difference in the world. Let me give you an example. If you borrow $1,000 at 7% interest on a 30-year note, I know that's ludicrous, $1,000 for 30 years, but I got news for you. My dad, first house that my dad bought he borrowed $3,000. By the way, he built the house for $3,000 himself uh, and borrowed $3,000 from the bank and he bought it on a 30-year note. Got it? $1,000 at 7% interest on a 30-year note comes out that the payment back is $2,395. You owe an extra in interest $1,395. The interest overtook the principal. Okay, you, let's just stretch that out. You buy a house for $100,000 at 7% interest over 30 years, and you're going to pay back the $100,000 plus $139.50 in interest over 30 years. You paid more than double for the house. Now, this just bogs my mind in every way, form, or fashion when somebody has paid their house off at 7% for 30 years. They bought the house for $100,000. They paid it off in 30 years. They sold it for $120,000, and they screamed from the mountaintops, we sold our house for $125,000. We made $25,000 profit off our house. How ignorant. How ignorant. They, bear, they, they didn't make any profit off that house. So if you borrow money, Israel, to the Israelites, do not charge them the bite of the venom. Do not charge them interest. You charge them for the cost, but that's it. A pledge. If whoever takes his neighbor's cloak as a pledge, you are to return it to him before the sun sets. Hang on. i got to explain this. For that is his only covering. It is his cloak for his body. What else shall he sleep in? And it shall come about that when he cries out to me, I will hear him, for I am gracious. Because he's going to be cold if you don't give him his coat back, cloak back. A cloak was a piece of cloth, six to eight foot long, at least five foot wide. 
You have seen them in every biblical picture and movie that you have ever seen. The people are wearing their regular clothes, and then they have this piece of material draped all over them, around their shoulders or whatever, okay? That is their cloak. It's not a coat. It is a cloak. It is a piece of material that they carried with them everywhere they went. If they went out to take care of the sheep in the field, they have it with them because they're probably going to spend the night. If they went on a journey, they had it with them. If they just went down to the gate to the city, they would take it with them. It was their cloak. They could use that as collateral. But get this. Every night... The person who lent them the money had to give that piece of material back for them to sleep under. But every morning, they had to return that cloak to the lender for collateral during the day. Every night, he would get it. Every morning, he turned it back in his collateral. Every night, he would get it, turn it back in his collateral. You had to do that. You had to do that. Why? Well, two things. Remember this. Every morning he'd sleep under, every night he'd sleep under his cloak and he'd be thankful to the Lord for its warmth. But every morning it was a painful reminder that he still owed the man money and he had to return it as collateral. I'm not sure we shouldn't do car loans this way. Yeah. You keep your car down at the bank. At 8 o'clock in the morning or 7.30 you go get the keys to the car and you drive it to work. You go by the grocery store. On the way home, you drop off the groceries, take the car back to the bank for the night. It's in the bank's care for the night. Next morning, you get up and do the same thing over and over and over again. Every day, you get to drive your car. Every night, you have a painful reminder that you owe that money to that bank. I think if some of y'all who are in debt would have, I'm getting personal now, so just hang on. I think if some of y'all had a keener sense of the debt that you were under and the bondage that you were under, you would do anything and sell anything to get out from under that debt. If you had a daily reminder, because you had to deliver it back to the lender to keep as collateral. Now, you can't deliver your house to your lender. I understand that. We'll go on. You shall not curse God nor curse a ruler of your people. Now, the word curse in our language means to speak foul language towards, and I understand that. That's not the meaning of the word curse here. When you're doing your Bible study, you see a word like that, go look it up. The word curse means to say something trivial or slight or trifling, okay? That's what it means. So, in other words, the Lord is saying, you shall not cast any allegation against God or against your rulers that is trifle that is trifling that is unimportant that is insignificance you have every right to cast a verdict or say something that has true substance to it you have every right to do that but you do not have a right to say oh i don't like him because i don't like the way his hair is combed i don't like him because he wears the same suit every day may not be the same suit but looks like the same suit doesn't he have any type of uh fashion design whatsoever it's always a blue suit it's a blue suit here blue suit there looks like the same suit oh he may change ties but the same white shirt same blue suit that's trifle that's unimportant i don't like what he's doing why because of the clothes he wears don't do that to god and don't do that to your rulers you shall not delay the offering from your harvest or your vintage. The firstborn of your sons you shall give to me. You shall do the same with your oxen and with your sheep. It shall be with its mother for seven days. And on the eighth day, you shall give it to me. When it says a lamb or a sheep one year old, it means in that first year. In reality, it means it's eight days old. That lamb or that sheep that's going to be offered, it means it's eight days old. It could be a little older if needed, but it is supposed to be the first one, the very first one. It's not the lamb's 20th baby. It's not the goat's 20th kid. It's not the sh anything like that. It's the very first one when it's eight days old is to be offered to the Lord and given as a sacrifice to him. I do the same thing with all the plants, by the way, in my garden. Everything. The very first 
orange of the year, the very first lemon of the year, the very first lime of the year, the very first okra pod of the year, the very first, I can just keep going because I got all this stuff in my garden, all right? The very first, I will take my pocket knife, I will slice it open, and I will lay it there before the Lord. And lo and behold, my lime tree, I have so many limes, they're not ready yet, but I'll never use that many limes. Even if I juice them, I don't know if I can juice them all. That's unbelievable. I have, so, I have two five-gallon buckets that have three okra plants in it because I didn't want the okra in my ground. So I put them in five-gallon buckets. I have, I have a half a freezer of okra that we have not fixed one bit of it yet. But I go out there every day. I'll make the corner. I'll drive up in the afternoon, look, cast my eye across the swimming pool to those okra buckets and plants, and lo and behold, what was this long this morning is this long today, and it's not any good anymore. That's what it seems like. You know, okra, you got to pick it every day because you missed something the day before. It grows that much a day. And the Lord's bountiful harvest Every time I sit down before a meal, I will say this. Thank you, God, for this food. Amen. Now, I don't pray for you at my meal. I don't pray for my family at my meal. I don't pray for the doom and gloom in my office at my meal. I focus on the meal and I say, God, thank you, God, for this food. Amen. And my whole family says, Amen. I don't say, Lord, please help my daughter as she's taken off into this new adventure in this school and she's going to be under such stress like she's never been under before. Blah, 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 blah. No, it's God. There's other time for that. There's other times for that. And you want to do that privately where it's between you and the Lord where nobody else hears it when you're praying those things. However, the firstborn is also to be given. The first child, not the fifth child, not the fourth, the first child of every mother is to be given to the Lord. But, but, fear not, it's not going to be slain because the Lord is now going to tell us in just a little bit what the redemption, because humans are to be redeemed. Redeemed. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Every human is to be redeemed, and there is a price for that redemption. And the Lord will tell us that later on in Exodus. Right now, we just know that the child on the eighth day is to be presented to the Lord. That mother and that father will take that child home, but the Lord's going to add to that later. Now, here's the next thing. And you shall be holy men to me. Therefore, you shall not eat any flesh torn to pieces in the field, you shall throw it to the dogs. Folks, don't think too much about this. This is just plainly the way God made us. The human digestive system that we have cannot handle food that we cannot determine how long it's been since it's been slain or killed. And in fact, if it has been slain and killed and laying out in the field when it's not cold as ice or whatever for more than four hours, you're probably in trouble, number one. Number two, we know, we know that once an animal is killed, whether it's killed in a slaughterhouse up in some town, uh, until it is cooked and on your food, it cannot be out of certain range of temperatures for more than four hours. So when they kill that cow in Pittsburgh, Texas, from that time a clock starts ticking. They either have to quickly get that meat down below 40 degrees or they have to cook that meat and get it above 140 degrees. They get it below 40 degrees with that time clock kicking. They can now keep it frozen or keep it cold and go to the, uh, to the grocery stores with it under cooling. That time clock is paused because it's below 40 degrees. Now that 
Kroger's or that H-E-B or that Randall's takes it out of the cooler and lays it in a semi-cool place and the time clock has started again because even though it may be slowed because of the cool that's in that cooler, that time clock is slowed down just a little bit. But lo and behold, if four hours from the time it was slaughtered and out of that temperature range, either below 40 degrees or not above 140 degrees, it's in that in between those two degrees and it hits four hours, that meat has to be disposed of because it has begun to build up toxins in it that your body cannot survive. At 140, it's been cooked. Then it has to go under these steam tables or these light tables that keep it at 140 above. But the clock is just slowed on that because that even has a time limit on it. You keep it in good temperature because even there are diseases and there are bugs that grow in that meat at temperature that will get to the point where it will kill you too if you get those bugs. Our digestive system cannot handle meat that we have not properly cut, killed, cut, bled, cooked, prepared, and put it into our bodies in a certain time amount. A dog, on the other hand, As with many other animals that are out that God has made, it doesn't matter if that thing is fresh just now or three days from now sitting out in the sun. The dog's digestive system has been made such by the Lord that it can eat anything that's out there. You, human, you humans, just be careful. In fact, in Genesis chapter 9, verses 4 and 5, the Lord says, You shall not, as humans, eat anything that still has the blood in it. That's the reason why the way we clean our deer, the way we clean our animals, to bleed the blood out of them, because we are not to have the blood in them. Why? Because over in Egypt, they ate blood in everything. Over in Canaan land, they ate blood in everything. And the Lord says, I want you to be holy. I want you to be different than these people these Canaanites. I want you to be different from where you've come from. I want you to be different from where you're going. I want the people to look at you by the way you eat, by the way you walk, by the way you dress, by the way you talk, by the way you worship God to look different than the Canaanites in their land. And they will. The Canaanites would wear short little skirty things where everything in the world showed if the wind blowed, but the Israelites would wear longer to be careful. Those Canaanites would shave the sides of their heads and the sides of their beards and wear goatees and put all sorts of cut marks and everything upon them and tattoos. The Lord says, I don't want that. Leviticus 19, I don't want that. My people are going to look different. If you're going to be holy, you're going to smell different. You're going to walk different. You're going to act different. You're going to talk different. You're going to be different than the rest of the world. A thing that Israel had a hard time doing. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this time to study your word, to study your ordinance and the parts that you have placed before us here in this lesson. Lord, I know those were for Israel, but Lord, they are good recommendations for us. May we live by them too. In your name, amen and amen.